Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Chris, for that nice introduction. As Chris said, my name is Matt Chirac. I am the Applications Engineer for the Simulation Products, one of the few we have. I am located in the Denver, Colorado office, so I'd like to thank you all for attending today. What we're going to cover this afternoon is simulation and how simulation can help guide your designs, whether it's a product that already exists that you may be looking to improve upon, or maybe it's a product still in the design phases that you want to validate and make sure that it's going to perform well. We're going to cover a few different aspects of simulation that can help with these types of workflows. I like to start off these webinars by covering sort of a broad spectrum of all of our simulation products. So this is everything related to SOLIDWORKS simulation that we offer. On the right, you'll see our SOLIDWORKS flow simulation and SOLIDWORKS plastics. Um, we're not going to cover so many of those today. I encourage you, if you have any questions, to reach out to your local CHI representative, and we'd be happy to discuss those with you online for those products. Instead, today, we're going to cover the products on the left. You'll see that we have three brackets for simulation standard, professional, and premium. And these are the three flavors, if you will, of our FEA simulation that we offer. And we're going to kind of pick and choose a few different study types out of each of these. So today we're mostly going to be focusing on linear static simulation, which is very robust for metal components. And then we'll get into a little bit of frequency analysis as well as some design optimization. And then to cap everything off, we'll get into some linear dynamics specifically related to harmonic analysis. So that being said, let's get introduced to the case study that we're going to deal with today. So simulation is the key tool for design validation, as I say over and over again. And in this particular case, we're going to look at this lawnmower platform. You can see on the left, we have a gentleman that's standing on this platform uh, riding, uh, riding lawnmower. So um, we need to make sure that this platform meets a few different criteria. Whenever you have a sort of human interface part like this, whether it be something somebody stands on or a handle that somebody holds or any sort of thing that touches the human body, you want to make sure that first and foremost, this product is safe. Right? We don't want anyone getting hurt by our designs. Secondly, and getting more and more important as time and technology progresses, we want to make sure this product is comfortable. Right? If somebody like this gentleman is going to be riding this for hours at a time, we want to make sure that it's not going to cause excessive fatigue or maybe excessive vibrations, things like that. So we're going to leverage simulation to sort of take those types of things into account. The way we're going to do this is with three simple steps. So first and foremost, we want to make sure it's safe to stand on. The way we're going to quantify that is with a factor of safety. And we kind of chose a factor of safety of 2.5 in this case which is fairly standard. Next, we're going to look at can it withstand the vibrations. Whenever you have something that's bolted or connected somehow to an assembly that has an internal combustion motor, there's going to be some inherent vibrations in that. Most motors vibrate between about 25 and 60 hertz, depending on throttle and maybe how fast, how many RPMs the motor is going. So we want to make sure that any design for this particular platform are out of that range, meaning make sure that they have a resonant frequency that doesn't fall between 25 and 60. Lastly, we're going to put some criteria on how comfortable the rider is going to be. We're going to quantify that at the end. So first and foremost, we want to see, is this product safe to stand on as is? So that being said, I'm going to hop into SOLIDWORKS here. And here you can see the product existing in SOLIDWORKS. We have just a simple sheet metal part with four brackets on the back of it. Okay, And we want to make sure that this product is safe to stand on. We want to check for that factor of safety of two and a half. So first things first, I'm going to put this back in its initial orientation here, and you'll see why I did that in just a minute. So anything that exists in SOLIDWORKS can be easily translated into simulation. There's a lot of simulation packages out there that require you to export from your CAD program, import into simulation, set everything up, analyze it, heaven forbid you need to change something in your design, you then have to repeat that process over and over and over again. So the benefit of SOLIDWORKS simulation is we can work directly with our native CAD geometry. So I'll go ahead and just start up a simulation, walk you guys through the setup, show you how easy it is to set up, and then we'll take a peek at some results here. So first things first, we are in our simulation tab. All we have to do is click Define New Study here. We're going to start off with linear statics. 
So we'll start a, a static analysis. And just like that, I'm in simulation. You can see I have my simulation command manager up here. I have a, a simulation study tree right here that's very similar to your CAD tree. And also, this is just a split window here. I can go back into any of my parts if I wanted to, and I could change the gauge of my sheet metal right from here. I could change my uh, miter flanges. I can change all sorts of stuff, and it won't affect my simulation because everything is linked to the parametrics of our model. So in order to set up a simulation, the first thing we have to do is tell the program, what is this made out of? That's going to be the main factor in the structural rigidity. So we'll just go ahead and apply the basic alloy steel. It's just the general steel that comes with some simulations, sort of the default here. But as you can see, there's a large list of other steels that's included. All these other folders have large lists of materials that are also included with the simulation package as well. But we're just going to stick with the default for now. Okay. So now that we've told the program what this thing is made out of and how rigid it is to resist loading, we now have to tell it how this product is kind of put together. So on the back, you can see our four mounting brackets here. We need to tell the program how those interface with the actual stand itself. So by default, everything that is touching in simulation is just treated as globally bonded, meaning that those tabs are bonded to the platform as if they were welded, which is going to be what they are in the end anyway. So that is perfectly fine as is for the default. Next thing we have to do is tell the program how this product interacts with the world around it. So it's going to be bolted to the actual lawnmower itself. So we're going to use some fixed hinge and fixtures here that do a decent job at approximating bolt connections. Um, we do have virtual bolt connectors in simulation, but for this type of analysis, these will do just fine. All right. So now that we have those four fixed hinges defined, go ahead and accept that. Last thing we have to do is tell this program how the part is going to be loaded. So I'm going to go ahead and just apply a distributed mass. You can see here that I have two split faces that roughly approximate the shape and size of a human foot. So I'm going to apply our mass of about 200 pounds to that face those faces, I should say. And now that that's on there, the next thing we have to define is gravity. Mass doesn't apply any sort of force without gravity around. So we're going to apply gravity, make sure that that's going in the appropriate direction. It is. Go ahead and accept that. And then we're basically ready to run the simulation. First thing we have to do before we run it is just to create the mesh. I'll just go ahead and create a standard mesh so you guys can see how that looks. We're not going to run too many of these simulations live just for time constraints, and nobody wants to sit around on a webinar and watch progress bars. So I just wanted to show you how quick the meshing can be on a simple assembly like this. And from here, all I would have to do is click Run This Study. Instead, I'm going to switch to our previously defined study here that already has results with it. So we're going to switch to the stress plot. Let me, all right. So this is just the basic stress plot of our model. We can get uh, nice contours that show the areas of our model that are under the highest amounts of stress. Um, in this case, it's the bolted connections at the back, as we would expect. The magnitude of this von Mises stress is about 196 megapascals. Um, that may sound like a lot, but compared to the yield strength of the material, it's very little, actually. The yield strength, as you can see down here, is 620 megapascals. So we're not even close there. And what that means for us from a design standpoint, a safety standpoint, is that this product is nowhere near failing structurally. The material is nowhere near getting close to its material failure. So structurally, this thing is sound. It's not going to fail on anybody with the given load. One thing that's often overlooked in FEA is the displacement. Sure, something might not fail, but it could have some displacements that might not be very desirable for the final product. In this particular case, let's say we have this particular end displacing too far down that the person wants to fall off the back. That would be a bad thing. So let's go ahead and animate this and see how the displacement progresses through the simulation. So just like you would expect with that kind of load, it bows in in the middle a little bit and down at this back edge here. Now it looks like it's moving a lot. By default, SolidWorks um, exaggerates their displacement plots. And this particular plot is exaggerated by a factor of 100. If you look at our legend over here, the actual displacement is a little bit less than 3 quarters of a millimeter. But it's good to have these exaggerated plots so you know how things are moving. It's a decent sanity check to make sure that you've 
set up all your boundary conditions and fixtures appropriately that is deforming how you would expect. So with less than three quarters of a millimeter of displacement, I'd say we're in pretty good shape for the displacement aspect of this structure. But the ultimate goal that we were looking at from my PowerPoint slides is the factor of safety. We want to know what is the factor of safety on this particular structure. So we'll go ahead and activate the factor of safety plot. And it gives us a nice little flag out here showing us that our minimum factor of safety is about 3.1. That's well above the 2.5 factor that we had dictated in our PowerPoint slide. So in some cases, you might say, this is, you know, this is perfect. We're well above our factor of safety, moving on to the next biggest and best thing. But we have other constraints to take into account as well, including vibrations. And we'll get to those in just a second. So I'm going to just jump back into my slide deck here, and we'll take a look at sort of a summary of what we did. So our first task, is it safe to stand on? Absolutely. Our minimum factor of safety that we had dictated was 2.5. We're sitting pretty here at a 3.1 factor of safety, so we can say that this product is indeed safe. That's great. We were able to do this using linear static analysis, which is included in SolidWorks CAD Premium and also SolidWorks Simulation Standard. There's a lot of bleed over between those two, but it, linear static analysis is perfect for simple metal assemblies like this, and we can assume that those results are good to go for safety. Next thing we have to consider is, can it withstand the vibrations? Remember, I talked about most internal combustion motors go between about 25 and 60 hertz for their vibrations. So we need to make sure that we don't have a resonant frequency that falls within this range. We've all seen the video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and you know, resonant frequency failures and things like that, and it's not pretty. So we want to make sure that our resonant frequencies don't fall anywhere in that 25 to 60 hertz range. So we'll go ahead and leverage SOLIDWORKS to help us figure that out. So again, I'm going to jump back into SOLIDWORKS here. And we'll go ahead and hide this plot. So let's start a frequency analysis. It's done just like the linear static analysis that we did. We just go up here to our new study, go down to a frequency analysis, go ahead and click the green check. And even though it's a whole different solver, a whole different type of FEA really at its core, SOLIDWORKS keeps the interface looking the same so that it's much easier to pick up for people who are used to the SOLIDWORKS interface. Instead of going through the whole setup again, I'm actually just going to copy the setup that we've already done. No use doing work twice, right? So I'm going to copy the material definition, our connections, our fixtures, our loads, and even down to our mesh. And I'm just going to drag it over into our new study here. It's going to say that we have to remesh for the contacts. That's fine. So. Now that we have all of our setup copied over, again, working and doing the same work twice is something that SOLIDWORKS desperately tries to avoid to try to make you guys faster. All we have to do for this frequency analysis is now to tell it how many frequencies we want. So if I go into the properties of the frequency analysis, the main input is number of frequencies. Mathematically, any part, any solid body has an infinite number of resonant frequencies. But for the most part, it's really only the first five or 10 or so that you're really concerned about. For this particular component, that's going to be perfectly fine. We'll stick with five, but if you had to solve for more frequencies, you definitely could through here. And again, instead of running this through and showing everybody a bunch of progress bars, I'm going to just going to switch to my previously solved study here. And this is what the results of a frequency analysis would look like. This is what's called an amplitude plot or a mode shape plot. And what it is, is it shows you how a part would deform if excited at a particular resonant frequency. So mode shape one corresponds to resonant frequency number one, mode shape two, frequency two, so on and so forth. So this is the sort of deformation, the way that this part would vibrate if it was excited by that first resonant frequency. And it might be hard to see through the WebEx, but up here you can see that that first resonant frequency value is 55. Unfortunately, that lies right in the range of what we are trying to avoid. Remember, we are trying to avoid anything in the 25 to 60 range. So it looks like we're going to have to do some rework here. And we definitely don't want anybody standing on this while it's vibrating like that. But before we get into changing the geometry of this, let's just make sure that there are no other kind of frequencies in that range. So I can go in here and list all of the resonant frequencies that I solved for. 
So number one, you can see right here, is that 55 resonant frequency. So we have to make sure that we do something to change that. The next one is until almost 100, and then there's a couple more in the 100s range, and we get up to 200. Typically with frequencies, they'll start to climb very, very, very quickly. So there's really only one in the range that we're concerned about that we have to worry about. So how do we go about changing that then? There's two ways to change your resonant frequency. One is to add more mass to the assembly. So a couple things I could do, maybe I could thicken up the sheet metal, or maybe I could take a few holes out of it to add more mass, you know, some things like that. Another thing that you can do to alter your resonant frequencies is to change how stiff the structure is. And that's the way that we're going to use here. So I'm just going to go ahead and do like a back view on this. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to move these brackets apart slowly. So because everything is parametric and simulation will maintain its link to the CAD data, I can just go into the mates folder here. I can choose this distance mate. You can see the highlight right here. And I can change that distance over and then just click run again on my frequency study. Take down the data, change it again, run again. And I could do that until I come up with a distance between those two that has a better resonant frequency. That's a manual way of going about it. It's perfectly valid, though it can be time consuming. Since we're in SOLIDWORKS, we're all about saving time and getting to market faster. Right? So instead, we're going to leverage this parametric power that we have here into what's called a design study. So I'm going to click New Study up here, and I'm going to go into Design Study. So Design Study is actually a function of SOLIDWORKS CAD. It can use inputs from simulation, but it's actually a CAD feature. So any numerical value on anything you might have in SOLIDWORKS you can use a design study to kind of optimize that. So if you want to optimize something for, I don't know, moment of inertia or mass or something like that, you can use design studies for that. In this case, we are going to use simulation data, so you would have to have a simulation license to do this. So what our variable is going to be is the distance between those two mounting brackets. I have it labeled as a parameter just called spacing. It's just linked to that distance mate. And I want it to vary between 0.8 inches and let's say 8 inches and then a step size of every four-tenths of an inch. So you can see here that it's going to build 19 total scenarios to analyze for me. Doing 19 scenarios by hand by just changing that manually and taking down the data would be incredibly time consuming. But through this interface, we're going to be optimizing it. You have to give some constraints to that design space, though. And constraints often fall into like we had, what we had in the PowerPoint, the design criteria. right? Our main constraint, the main reason we're in here, is because of our frequency. We want our first resonant frequency to be greater than 60 hertz. Right? We need to make sure that that first resonant mode is well out of the range of what our motor is going to be driving this platform at. And then finally, you want to give it a goal. What is the ultimate goal of this analysis? Well, anything, like I said, that involves a human interface, your ultimate goal is going to be safety. So, I have a minimum factor of safety variable here, and I want to make sure I maximize that. So I'm going to vary the distance between those brackets by uh, 4 tenths of an inch, going all the way up to 8 inches. I'm going to monitor the frequency and solve the frequency at each of those distances, and I'm going to solve the factor of safety at each of those distances, and I'm going to choose which one has the greatest factor of safety. So to run this, all you would do is click Run here. Again, I'm going to switch to our previously solved one, and you can see what the results would look like. So it has each of the individual scenarios listed here, scenario 1, 2, 3, so on, and we're varying between, this one goes between 0.4 inches and 8 inches. But you can get the values for the resonant frequency and the factor of safety directly out of this table. So up till about 1.6 inches, we're still in that 25 to 60 hertz range, as you can see by these red highlights here means that they failed our criteria that we set up. Once you get above scenario 4, now you have a resonant frequency of 62, which is out of that range. So if we were to go about this manually, that might have been where you stopped, right, if you were just doing these manual iterations. Instead, we were able to analyze the whole design space in a much more automated fashion. So as you can see, as they get further apart, you can actually just highlight these and watch it rebuild in real time. As they get further apart, our first resonant frequency keeps climbing, as does our factor of safety, which makes sense. These brackets are getting further apart. We're distributing the load over a greater distance. So it makes sense that this would be climbing. But which one is the best one? 
And this is the real power of the design study is, as you can see over here on the left, it gives us our optimal distance, which is 7.2 inches in this case. That correlates with a first resonant frequency of 107, so well out of that 25 to 60 range. And it actually increased our factor of safety to 5.8. Now, you might think, you know, that's easy. You should have had those far apart anyway. But this actually isn't the farthest distance that I analyzed for these two brackets here. So another thing that a design study can offer you is insight into your design that might not be so clear without tools like this. So I'm going to show a couple of graphs. The first graph is basically parametric distance. You can see the set one just coordinates with scenario one here and two and so on. So essentially this x-axis is just parametric distance of that spacing versus frequency. So as they get further apart, the first resonant frequency gets higher and higher, but only up to a certain point. Um, up to set 18, which happens to be our optimal, we get that resonant frequency of about 107. And then it actually starts to drop off a little bit after that. Um, so let's look at one more. This one is a little bit more interesting and something that might not be so obvious just from looking at it is, again, we have parametric distance on the x-axis, and then we have factor of safety on the y-axis. So we have this kind of curve, almost exponential increase in factor of safety up to, again, set 18, which happened to be our optimal. But beyond that, the factor of safety actually starts to go down. And this is something that, again, might not have been so obvious had we just done this manually. So what that means is as this gets further and further down, then we're actually starting to get some high stresses probably in the middle of this plate right here where you know it starts kind of caving in in the middle and it actually gets much higher stresses so this type of design insight is very powerful and is something that solidworks design studies will offer you even without simulation you can still do studies like this on just parametric cad stuff all right so let's kind of sum this up so we looked at can it withstand the vibrations well Unfortunately, not really. Our first design fell in the range that we did not want it in. It was about 55 hertz, and we wanted it to be at least over 60. But by using the power of parametrics inside of SOLIDWORKS, leveraged with the SOLIDWORKS simulation program, we were able to optimize it not only for a much higher first resonant frequency, but also for a much higher factor of safety at the same time. So we kind of killed two birds with one stone there. So last thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at how comfortable will this rider be? And we need to know, try to quantify this somehow on you know, what the end user is actually going to feel riding on this thing. And that's where we're going to get into some simulation premium dynamics type studies. So I'm going to hop back into SOLIDWORKS. And because this is our optimal, I'm just going to make sure that we're using this model. Right? You could just highlight this column. It will rebuild to that orientation. And we can just pick this up and run with it right there. We don't have to export it or save it as or anything. I can just go right here, click New Study, go down into Linear Dynamics. Whenever you're dealing with something with an oscillating motor of some kind, it's usually a harmonic style study. So we're going to make sure that we select harmonics here. Go ahead and accept that. And we go through kind of the same study tree that we did before. Again, I could just grab our entire setup from Linear Statics, drop it in here. You've already seen how to do that, so I'm not going to waste too much time doing that again. But I will show you some of the extra setup that is necessary for these types of dynamic studies. So first thing we have to do is we have to give the dynamic study sort of a range to look at. And let's look at between 0 and 200 hertz. It's very unlikely that this motor, whatever it's driving over, is going to cause a vibration more than about 200 hertz. So that will be the range of frequencies that we're going to look at, the range of harmonic frequencies. Okay. Next thing we have to do is apply what's called a base excitation. In order to do that, I just need a fixture in here. So we're just going to add one of the bolted fixtures in just so I can show you how to set up a base excitation. So a uniform base excitation is usually something that you would add to a model if it's mounted to something and the object that it's mounted to is going to cause some sort of movement or excitation in the model. So in this case, let's say that we know that the bars that come off of the lawn mower are going to provide a maximum displacement of about a quarter of an inch. 
let's say we ran FEA on the rest of the lawnmower, or maybe we know this from experimental data. Either way, we know that the excitation that's going to be given to this part through its fixtures is going to be about a quarter of an inch. We're going to analyze that excitation over a frequency range of 0 to 200 hertz. So that excitation of a displacement coupled with a frequency is going to excite some resonant modes, and we're going to be able to see how violent this thing will become, how, how much it will vibrate, and how uncomfortable it will become. The last thing you need to define for a linear dynamic study is a damping. So whenever you have vibrations, especially like structural vibrations, we need to add in some sort of damping coefficient to damp those vibrations out. Because in real life, we would have localized material damping, or even the air can steal energy from assemblies, that kind of thing. So we add a damping in here. And then the only other thing would be all the basic setup that we did before, and you would run the analysis. Again, I'm going to switch to my previously defined study here, and we're going to take a look at the results. The results are going to be very similar to the linear static analysis for the most part, except for the fact that when I animate this, I'm not animating sort of a steady state. I'm animating a excitation of this model over a range of frequencies. So I'm going to click Animate here. and You can see up at the top the frequency that it's at when this thing starts moving. So the first almost 100 hertz of this frequency range does not really see anything happen to this model. It's not until we get close to that first resonant mode that we start getting this strange bowing behavior happening due to excitation of that first resonant frequency here. So this sort of data can be very, very useful for us to understand what's going to happen at higher frequency ranges. We can also take advantage of sensors. Sensors are another SOLIDWORKS CAD tool that we can leverage in simulation to give us better design insight. So I have an acceleration sensor set up here. And this sensor is set up to give me the maximum acceleration at any node um, throughout the range of frequencies. So as you can see, between 25 and 60 hertz, our acceleration in terms of Gs is very, very minimal. That means that if there is any vibration in there, it's going to be a very, very small amount. But you can see as it gets up closer into the 100s and 150s that that acceleration becomes very, very violent. And that, the higher that value is, the more an end user could feel it. So let's take a look at some more localized plots here. So I have two resultant plots that are basically just taken from a node on each of the sides where the person's foot would be. And this plot in particular, again, it's 0 to 200 hertz. This is plotting resultant displacement. So this type of displacement is happening due to the base excitation at certain frequency levels. So between our 25 and 60 hertz, we're hardly feeling any displacement at all. So the user, this is going to be what the user would really feel, is things moving at this magnitude of displacement with an acceleration relative to that other plot that I had showed. So they're hardly feeling any displacement at all, less than a tenth of an inch. So we're in really good shape there. Also, we can do a localized acceleration plot as well. And the plot's very similar. Again, between 25 and 60 hertz, it's very minimal. Right, with a maximum happening at this 107 hertz range where we're exciting that first resonant mode. And you probably don't want to be on this thing if that resonant mode is excited. This would be the most violent area. So based on that displacement and this acceleration, we can say that you know, the user is going to be as comfortable as possible on this particular stand. Those amounts of displacement and vibration are going to be easily damped out by rubber and boots. You know, maybe the bolted connections that go into this stand would absorb some of that energy as well. So it's going to be very, very minimal impact on our end user. So uh, how comfortable will the rider be? Well, we were able to get actual displacement and acceleration data at local points using our linear dynamics that's included in simulation premium. So we could take that data and go and to, to like a shaker table or some sort of testing station and validate that. But from a design standpoint, it looks to be good to go for the end user. So to kind of wrap everything up, we looked at three basic types of criteria for our design. We started off, is it safe to stand on? Yeah, initially we had a factor of safety of 3.1, which was much higher than our 2.5 criteria. So we did that with just basic SOLIDWORKS CAD Premium and or SOLIDWORKS Simulation Standard. That was very quick, easy structural analysis. 
Then we went into Simulation Professional with a frequency analysis and asked ourselves, can it withstand our vibrations from our motor? Well, no, we discovered a bit of a problem, right? Our first resonant frequency was in the range of the motor driving frequency. So we had to make some design changes, but we were able to leverage a design study to help us optimize not only that resonant frequency, but it also optimized our factor of safety at the same time. So a little bit of a win-win there. And then finally, we were able to run into linear dynamics and get some data about how much displacement and how much acceleration the end user is going to feel at a particular point and compare that to maybe some criteria for comfort that we might have. So that kind of wraps up what I had to present here. I wanted to show this slide for some upcoming webinars. Tune in next week. We have a great webinar on drawing automation and you know, setups related to that. It was presented at SOLIDWORKS World. It's a great presentation. I highly recommend it. The week after that, we have some 3D printing webinars, which are always awesome. And then next month, tune in for some routing webinars that we might have. But to finish up, I wanted to open it up to any questions that we might have, anything that's come in the chat. Feel free to chat now if you have any questions um, related to what I showed. Okay, looks like I got one question. It's a two-part question. So first part is how do you determine your frequency range? Um, I'm assuming you're asking about the range requirements that we had, that 25 to 60 hertz. All I did for that was I took RPMs and converted them into hertz, really. So 25 to 60 RPMs correlates to about 1,000 to 3,000 RPMs on a motor. So that's kind of how I came up with that range. And it would vary a, a little bit, but um, in general, that's how I did that. And then the second question there is, how do you determine the dampening values? That's a question that is very embedded in linear dynamics and modal analysis as a whole. There's a lot of literature out there that goes into how to determine damping values and things like that. Traditionally, what most people recommend is you find a study that was done, an experimental study that was done on a structure, maybe similar to yours, and they can actually calculate experimentally the damping values. So you would use values like that or, you know, default kind of point to the typical default, but the best thing to do is use damping values that were defined experimentally based on similar structures. All right, the question is, is the mass 200 pounds important to the dynamic analysis? Yes, it is. Dynamic analysis is based on what's called the modal analysis theory, and essentially what that boils down to is if you have any sort of forces applied to your structure, that is actually going to change the stiffness of the structure. So if you think of like a pop can, if you're not putting any force down on the top of it, when you press the side in, really nothing happens. But if you put a lot of compressive force on the top of a pop can and you tap the side, it's much more likely to collapse. That's due to the fact that we're lowering the stiffness of the structure to a point where it is more prone to failure. So yes, the 200 pounds mass is something that is very important to the dynamic analysis. So another question from Dan was the necessary to use 200 pounds distributed mass as opposed to a 200 pound force. Actually, it was applied as a 200 pound force, and I can show that here. So in the dynamic analysis, it was actually applied as a 200 pound force going down. Because of the nature of the dynamic analysis, it was just easier to apply it as a pound force as opposed to a mass with gravity applied. Excellent question. You're welcome, Dan. All right, guys. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to any of your local CHI representatives. Me or Chris would be happy to get you talking to the right person. Thank you all for attending. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to say to wrap things up? Just thank you very much, Matt. Great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Take care.